McCarlin's through, he might go for it, still going, trying to barge his way through, goes to the oh, what a Arriving Ryan O'Neill from an almost impossible angle, and that's the rousing score I'm now we're looking for. This Connor Turbot kicks this one in, oh that is absolutely superb. Hello everybody and welcome back to the Sideline A podcast. You're very welcome to our preview show and we're looking ahead to the five games coming up this weekend. We have two games in the Senior Championship playoffs and three Junior Championship quarterfinals. So we'll touch on all the games and I'm delighted to be joined by Arne Finden and he's going to help me preview everything coming up this week. And Arne, we're, we're well into Championship um, football now and Championship knockout football which is what we've all been waiting for. And um, obviously the four group winners are through to the quarters and we're going to find out this week. Clan Iron have joined um, that four, as have Mullabon. We're going to find out who else is going to make it. So it's it's exciting now, the, the stage of the championship that we're at. Well, it's exciting, but it's probably the, the part of the championship where everybody cries out for. Everybody talks about the likes of Tyrone and having the knockout football. We are now in knockout football, so... It's, it's do or day, really, for everybody. Um, and that's where the excitement comes from. You could be good, you could be bad, but on the day, who knows what's going to come. So that's where that's where the fun begins. And we have, we have two teams that are going to exit the championship this week because um, we have two games coming on in the senior championship and two playoff games on Saturday night in the box at Athletic Grounds. Silverbridge take on Cross McGlynn. That's at 6 o'clock. And then on Sunday in Silverbridge, it's Calivi against Green Moor. So its season is on the line for these four teams in the senior championship and both of these will be live on Arma TV as well. So Arn we'll start with, with Silverbridge and Cross. Um I suppose Silverbridge have met Cross so many times down through the years in championship and um, maybe four or five times in the last couple of years. They haven't got over the line against them. And um, there was a couple of heavy defeats there but They've probably just been edging closer and closer to cross, and the more it goes on, you're starting to think maybe they're going to get over the line here eventually against them on, on the bridge. I suppose they'll, they'll have no fear. They're going in here hoping and confident that they, they can finally get over the line again cross. Yeah, like the no fear one is, is probably a, a big, like kind of a big bridge to get, the, or a big gap to bridge, sorry. Um, it's like traditionally, Cross McGlenn had teams beat throughout Ireland just on their, their reputation and their name alone. Now them guys have become more accustomed with each other over the years. So like you're kinda of going out there and you're marking a player that all right, if you've never marked them before, you're kinda of going on reputation rep or on, on their name. But now all of a sudden after playing them four or five times and gotten comfortable and getting used to them, you're like, ah, like they're another player. All right, they're good. They have their strengths, they have their weaknesses. But like Silverbridge in, in their camp will be going pound for pound. They'll be bigging themselves up saying we're, we're every bit as good talent-wise. It's now just time to get across the line, really. Um, so I would say that's the that's the key message for them. Because even looking at their, their kind of like their league form, I just went through it their, this evening. Um, in April, at the very start of the league, Silverbridge beat Cross. They won 11 to 9 points. So that's that's kind of like getting across that line and getting the monkey off the back of their like, oh, happy days. And that was in Silverbridge too. So that's a, that's a big turning point for them. And then, all right, a way across that got beat. Uh, I think it was one twelve to eight points. But again, they still have it in the back of their head that they can go down and they can they can do a job. Um, like, and the big pitch source suits them. It was last last year they played each other. Um, and realistically, they were well in the game about 10 minutes to go. And then Rain just become his, his marquee self and, and, and put a wee bit of distance stuff between them but for a long period they had cross on the ropes and now they're going to be going you know what yours are coming up against boys it's now just time to, to add that extra 10 minutes and just try and see the game out that wee bit longer like. I think that was two years ago I think that was 2022 but that, that game that you're talking about that was the one I thought Silverbridge had them that day and as you said Rain O'Neill maybe just stepped it up a wee bit at the end I think it was maybe four or five points um, in it but just talking about Rain O'Neill um, obviously he was suspended against Sarsfields um, after getting put off against Clans but he came back against Green Moore last week and finished with 2-3 
um, and we had a few highlights on our, our podcast last week um, of the two goals, obviously, and seeing Paul Hurdy tweaking out a, a 50-yard free kick that had, had plenty of distance on it. It could have went on a little bit, but Ray O'Neill coming back in, that's I suppose that, that's a scary stat that he scored 2-3 last week, Silver Bridge are, are going to have to tie him down, and that's, that's easier said than done, and it's an obvious thing to say, but it's something that they're going to have to work on. <laughs> it's one of those things you have to work on. It's almost a thing in my head, depending on where he plays, it kind of dictates how much how much you let him score. So if he's obviously if he's playing inside and he's playing in full forward line, you're kind of worrying on him. You're like, right, we have to keep this man as few scores as possible. If he's out around the middle and he kicks two or three points, are you happy enough? So long as that he's not really dictating the play, like you could. Could you mark him and try and keep him from playing passes in and getting off the shoulder and supporting and breaking lines and tackles and, and laying the ball off and just sacrifice that he might get in a bit of space and kick two or three from, from distance? You uh, Arguably, I would take it um, because the, the alternative is he controls the game far too much um, from an opposition point of view. Like, and you, you just don't want him doing that. So he's like he's one of those players he's, it's the argument where it's the same as Michael Murphy he can play inside he can play he can do fullback realistically if he wanted to um, and probably do a good job at it but depending on more cross playing it would kind of depend if I was so rich on how to mark him and um, again if he's right around the middle pre- just try and press everything on his foot and if he slips past and kicks one from distance don't get too worried about it but if he goes inside you have to be squeaky clean and, and, and try and and just try and hold him up and, and, and limit the amount of influence that he has in there. And, but again, it's hard. It, like he's just one of those players, like it's just hard to do. Damn, you do, damn, you don't. But you just accept he's going to score. Just try and work, worry about the rest of the team. Like. If he's playing out around the middle, or I'm trying to think of maybe matchups, does. And maybe a Jarlio Burns go on him and go, you know, fight fire with fire, sort of hammer the hammer with him, or is Jarlio Jarlio maybe but picked up by a Caelan um instead, or maybe an Ashton O'Neill. So it's I suppose just getting the matchups right. We're talking about Ray O'Neill. You have to mark Ashton O'Neill as well. Stephen Morris out around the middle too. Mentioned Comiskey coming from deep. Came McCampbell inside. Like I'd, I'd assume Jack McCard is probably going to pick him up as he, he usually does, but. There's, there's a lot of fires to put out with Cross McGlynn, that's an obvious thing to say, but um, I suppose it, it's Silverbridge trying to put out them fires and maybe they don't want to waste Jarley Oakburns with a man marking job. There, there's a lot of headaches on only whatever six or seven days trying to sort them out. There, there's a lot of headaches, and to be fair to both teams, both of them, uh, now it's been a long time since <laughs> that I've ever played Cross, um, but haven't watched them, they will genuinely try to play 15 on 15 and play on the front foot football we've played silver bridge for a few more times over the years and again they try to play on the front football and they try to play head head with you so matchups wise would be um, would be more of a headache for silver bridge than it would be would be for a cross the easy thing for silver bridge to do is kind of do that whole zonal defensive structure and zonal marking and zonal pressing and like if our sheen rain callum uh, Kane, well, Kane have to be more man, man, man to man. Even like Stephen Morris, if they're coming through, then you, you, you engage with them as opposed to just going right behind. Want to follow this person on right pitch and, and kind of torture them. Um, I know Cross tried that sort of tactic against the likes of the clans that the followed Sophie and, and, and she and even right down into the, into the four four or into the clans only twenty one. I tried to put big hits and big tackles on, and the clan slipped one or, once or twice through the net and, and, and got a bit of joy on so whether or not cross are thinking they need to push that high up on on silverbridge again i'm not too sure but silverbridge have a choice either push up and go man to man and hope for that the the fitness start sorts the comes to comes to their highlight at the end or do they go into the zonal i don't think they'll go to zonal press but maybe a hybrid approach works that all right if if those key men have crossed have the ball in their own 45 don't really have to worry about them and we kind of engage with them at the halfway point as opposed to doing the traditional drop back to the 45 it's it, it, there's interesting matchups but again if i was silverbridge i wouldn't really i wouldn't be overthinking it too much like i would go out give someone a job whether it be jordi Oak. i don't know if jordi Oak would be your one to go on and mark rain 
or Oshin, you kind of want him to try you want to try and get him free and get him a wee bit more loose. Um Heat probably could do well him and um Stephen Morris had a good old battle there a couple of years ago, like they helped them to probably pick each other up because Pete's obviously an option, a big option for Silverbridge trying to get out of out of danger. Like it's that whole hammer, the hammer wants the balls dead, right? Can we look for our big men to try and get them get us away here? But I'm sort of thinking Yeah, I don't actually really know from a from a Silverbridge point of view who do you do you sacrifice someone just to go with man mark rain? Um personally I would do that 45 zonal press, but or sorry, the like the halfway zonal press and just say it once he comes through next year between two fellas he's he's sort of tagged. Um I'm trying to think. Yeah, that's 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 the best way to go about it really like. Yeah, it's it's really hard to know, and obviously, um, Silver Bridge are, are going to have their headaches, but um, they would know their matchups uh, much better than what me and you would. But I suppose uh, just speaking to offer, Arn, and we we're chatting about you know how open really the championship is, and that a lot of teams would fancy their chances if if Silver Bridge can cause an upset this weekend and knock out their neighbours. It it could be a bit like Dublin getting knocked out in the uh, All Ireland series. Everybody sort of. That thought they had a chance, suddenly it's a realistic possibility. But um, I suppose that the question is, can Silverbridge do this? It's it's a big ask for them. But as I said, they've been nearly inching closer and closer to cross. They've finished third in the league and this year just behind cross. They're, um, I suppose that they were disappointed to lose against Clevey in round three and that they, they ended up coming third in the group. But the... Is this the time that they have to do it, or are Cross still going to just edge that wee bit ahead of them? It, it would throw it would be like a nuke to the championship, realistically, if Silverbridge overturned Cross. Um, not that I, I don't think they're potent, they're, they're capable of it. Um, I'm just thinking like Silverbridge, they're they're big players. They're like straight down the middle, even like Paddy Ray. Like just they all need to kind of be on it and, and just believe they can get across the line. Because as we were saying off our truthfully, this is this is. Out of all the out of the last ten years of the Armagh Championship, this is the year where like an underdog could realistically just pop their head above the surface. Now I'm I'm a big believer that the once you get a knockout champion, well, the quarterfinals, but now obviously we'll have this preliminary round stuff, um, which is the knockout championship. That's where the, that's where your big teams are always going to be anyway, and like it kind of will weed itself out to an extent. Like the, there'll obviously be a wee blip in the motion where. A good team, maybe like some Murray last year, didn't make a like a playoff spot. Um, but nine times out of ten, your big teams are going to be there come come judgment day. Uh, but having said that, Cross just haven't really lit everything alight. Plan Earn haven't really lit everything alight, and they're your two they're your two big favourites. So the likes of Clans, Collie Hanna, the Corps definitely, and. Um, I've lost the last one. Madden. <laughs> Madden, yeah. They're all sitting in the quarterfinal with a wee bit of a break, a chance to look at all the teams and all sitting. Like, there's, there's nothing to fear. So, flip that script. Silverbridge are now looking at it going, we don't really have a whole lot to fear. Cross are always going to be a scalp for everybody. Regardless, if they cross, you automatically put your name in the ring for it. Like, um, I do think momentum's kind of building in the right time for Cross. Obviously, they've had a, a really tough time over this last year, um, and more more recently over the last couple of weeks. Which just I don't really know how do you, how do you account for it? You do, you can't account for it. You just kind of see how see what roll the dice and see how things go. But the boys seem to have reacted in the right way. And personally, I would like to think that like if if some hopefully nothing ever happens in the same in our camp but if it did our boys would just batten down the hatches and put everything they have and row in behind the team so i and i can't imagine given the history and the tradition cross that they won't do that so they're going to come out all guns base and fire and kind of like that sort of siege mentality where people are are thinking that there's there's a chink in the chain and they can get at us you seen rain last week like all everybody's kind of looking at him going there was a chink in the chain with him. There, he's maybe a wee bit of discipline issues, or he maybe lost the head a wee bit. He might just kick two, three. That's it, job done. Everybody's like, oh, red shit, sorry. Apologies, we didn't want to poke the bar. Like, so you have to be careful what you wish for. Like, like if you just keep prodding and prodding, 
they're liable to come out and, and just rip you to pieces. Will that happen in terms of ripping silver bridge to pieces? I don't think so, just with the way the matches have went over this last way. Even looking at the referee, I think it's Martin Conroy, he lets it be very physical and he's he's, he's a good referee. Like there's he's clear with his uh, with his calls and his instructions and he makes sure that the game is allowed to flow and, and you'll get a lot of hits and a lot of just a lot of context. So both teams are happy with that, both teams are comfortable with that. It just kind of allows for a wee bit of fire to come across. And as I say, cross would would be the favourites. It'd probably be the sixty percent team, Silverbridge, if they win it. It's not it's not that it's a it's completely impossible. There is every every threat that they, they can do it. Um even like, like Tier Murphy, Sean Rock, between the two of them, up it scored four. 413, 414. That's <laughs> like that that poses a problem in itself. Like they're not a, they're not a pushover. They're not as if they're not it's not as if they're not going to do things um, and, and make a make a danger of themselves. Even last week and the week before against Cleavy, right up until the death, it was never said a attitude with them. So it's hard to put that to bed. But again, Cross and Glenn, Keane can be it will be dangerous. Arshin's very comfortable around the middle. Rain, we know Rain Stephen is a handful. I actually think him and Pete will be a great matchup. Um, even like Rico Kelly, he's doing a, a good job at, at fullback. Like he's he's just been an old hand. You Paul Hughes coming off, just adding adding danger. Komiski has shut people down. Cross have the, the higher percentage of winning, but again, it's not outside of the potentially. Yeah, I think I'm I'm on board with that. I think I'm just gonna tip Silverbridge just to be different a wee bit and um, maybe as you said, throw a nuke into the into the championship and that'll that'll really see um that'll see an exciting quarter final. Obviously if Cross weren't in it, but the likelihood is um they will be in it. But our second playoff then, our second senior championship playoff is Green Moore and Cleve, and this is a repeat of the twenty twenty two semi final. Which Graham Moore won on their way to reaching the their first ever county final. So, um, I suppose we're we're talking a bit about momentum there too. Or you had mentioned about um Cross just finding momentum at the right time. Cleve, same could be said about them. Obviously, um, a tough defeat the first day out against Cullihanna, but they've bounced back, um, with two wins on the trot against Cullaville on Silverbridge to reach second, and it's been a great start for Stevie McDonald. And his um, tenure in charge, but um, how big is his momentum in all of this, Aaron? Because as I mentioned, uh, Clevey have won their last two games. Um, Greymoor have lost their last two games to Clans and Cross. So, in terms of momentum and confidence in that, it's it's Clevey of the upper hand at the minute. Momentum is huge. Like especially championship football, you can't bat and you can't you can't fake it. Is the best thing to do. It. Like everybody can tell you you're great and you're brilliant, and you can. You can slightly believe them, but actions speak louder than words and across the board. So winning matches is, is what you want. Um, to be fair to Green Moor, they kind of finished their league with a massive amount of momentum. They put a they put a big push on and didn't nearly see it themselves. From honestly, I didn't even think they were going to they were going to do anything in the league. I thought they'd kind of just accepted where they were. But even right up until the last day, they had a fighting chance. Now. You then flip it. Their championship campaign just hasn't that that sort of momentum hasn't followed through. But they've played big teams. Not that every team's in the senior championship isn't a big team, but they've come up against Cross and Clans, who Cross are heavy favourites before it even started. Clans now have put themselves into a position to be heavy to be well, they're outside favourites, but realistically, like to have a a, a fair chance. Um, Clevey. First day out just seemed to have been a, a strange one. Maybe that it's the fact that they haven't played the likes of Collie Hanna in a while and they kind of got caught on the hop and just things fell apart. But the last two games they played Colville, Colville and Silverbridge. No disrespect, Colville. They're probably in the same situation as us where they're they're, they're punching and trying to get to, uh, as high up as they can. But on any given day, they, they feel like they can put a game up to someone. But realistically, they know that it's going to be a, a t- tough ask, Same, similar to ourselves in, in that respect. Like, but then they go out and they play Silverbridge, who, to be fair, is a tough game. But I would say Green Moore have had that harder group stage. 
So it's hard to it's hard to weigh up that sort of momentum and, and that that build up. I would just say both teams. There, there's a lot on the line for both teams in that. Graham Moore obviously realised their league campaign didn't really get off the flyer and, and probably doesn't reflect just what they've been doing over this last couple of years. Clearly, was something similar that didn't nearly pip at the post just by Graham Moore. Their league matches have been very close. I went through them. Clavey won eight, Graham Moore 10 points. And then the next match was Clavey 10 points, Graham Moore 11. So a win each, but both very tough, very, very tight games. There are scores against in the league, both of them. Clavey 167 or 176, Graham Moore 177. You can't really, you can't really get much tighter than that. Um, so to me, on the outside, just going by stats, which everybody rules the world on stats these days, it's a straight down the middle game. It will just come to how things are set up. So, and then player matchups and who who does the who gets their homework right and and say then short space it is anyway. Look. And I suppose in talking about those sort of small margins, I suppose, Aaron, um, this was a point I should have made the first um, for Cross and Silverbridge as well. But obviously, Clevey were sitting watching that Graham Moore and Cross game last week, you no know, one that they played, whoever finished third, whoever lost that game, and the likelihood was it was probably going to be Graham Moore. So is that a bit of an advantage for Clevey that they got to watch an entire Graham Moore game last weekend and they, no one they were going to play them like in terms of making matchups, whatever kick out tactics, attacking formations and stuff like is that is that a wee bit of an advantage for Cleve? Well it's not a disadvantage anyway. Um yeah. I remember Davy Wilson told us years ago we well, went out for a replay match. We drew with a team and then went out to play them like six days later and he always told us the team that can learn the most in the short space of time wins the game. That's it. He doesn't say like nobody else has to play any really any anything mental. It's just who can tactically learn the most. So from that perspective, Clevey definitely, definitely can learn can learn more about Graham Moore than, than vice versa. Graham Moore, they'll, they'll be able to go back over footage that they've maybe collected throughout the year and stuff on Clevey and, and go around it. But being at a live game and seeing things happening and understanding just even the reaction of how the bench is going and the, the sidelines going and, and how everybody's kind of feeding into the game. You don't see that on a, on a video camera. So from Clevey's perspective, yeah, definitely getting to watch them and with one eye on it, knowing that it's probably going to be Graham Moore. That that's that's huge. Like, and who who do you see coming out on top of this? On who do you see crashing out of the championship at this stage? Personally, I, uh, I would probably say Kalevi. Um, the same. What we're talking about momentum and stuff. They seem to have things going in the right way all right week one was a blip and the things inside the club kind of whatever happened i don't know i don't even know realistically what went on and um, but obviously something something drastic changed stevie's come in i listened to him talking that he was trying to get the boys to enjoy football and the mood just to play um, and it seems to have worked that could have it really could have went one or two ways boys could have just went geez sorry our managers whatever's happened but why why is that happened? Are we not good? Are we good? What where are we realistically? And they've completely flipped the script. So the, the, I would say in their camp they are riding high. They're very confident. They have good footballers. All right, the likes of Connor and Eli being out of the team, it'll be easier to have them in it. Um, but I'm, I'm I'm just actually thinking back to one player, Kieran O'Hanlon. I know from personal point of view he wouldn't be massively happy that he hasn't played a whole lot of county football over this last year year and a half so club football will mean a lot to him um, and to, just from knowing him in general to, to have a dip in performance throughout the team he won't really let it happen he won't accept it it's just it's not he's put in for too much time and effort over this last 12 18 months to play little football for the county and put that all on sacrifice to just let this all fizzle out over the space of three or four weeks. Um, so I'm going to go with Clevey, them as pushing on. Green Moore, you have uh, Brandon, is, he, he, he's, a, he's a tough nut to crack around the middle. He'll keep it tight, he'll keep it solid, he'll, he'll rally the troops around it. Uh, yeah, I, I think Clevey just have a few more options 
across the board than what Greymore have haven't watched Greymore haven't played against them like the, they're 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 quite strong they're quite physical but they do rely on dropping back making it difficult and hitting you on the counter which all right it, it works and it, it definitely gets you through games I just think for the way things are going in, in the Cleavy camp that they're all on a on a natural high the right impressive the wave that they can kind of push on a wee touch more also have that wee bit of an extra break and and just the, the know-how. So, yeah, Clevy would be my, my pick. Like. Yeah, I'm just edging for Clevy in that one too. Um, to, to come out on top, and I suppose it just comes down to, to scoring options. I think Graham Moore in the three games so far have been probably reliant on Jason O'Neill, um, while Clevy can spread their scores out a wee bit. So I think that will play a part. Um, as I'd mentioned at the start, the Junior Championship quarterfinals are on this weekend, Arne, and we'll have... It's Michael's Newtown taking on Amport Moor. That's on Saturday in Abbey Park. And that'll be live on Armagh TV just ahead of the cross on Silverbridge game. With College Land on St Peter's Seconds in Clonmore on Sunday. And Fark Hill against the Summon in Kerkrup on at 3 o'clock on Sunday. That's going to be live on Armagh TV as well. And um, obviously, as I mentioned, Arne, St Peter's Seconds. Um, obviously, this is their first year trying to, to, to field a second team. They had a, a fairly decent league campaign. They've come into the championship um, and they've reached the knockout stages. They've reached the, the quarterfinals. We've seen Clonner last year going all the way in the junior championship in their first time entering a seconds team. Um, I don't know if St. Peter's are eyeing up a, a charge like that, but um, how's the how's the mood around the, the club and everything? This has obviously been a success so far. It- yeah, it, it depends on what way you define success across the board. Um, in terms of performance and on-field performance, the one three B, or sorry, well, they didn't actually win three B. The score difference, but they, they got promoted from three B. Um, the last day was all a bit of a, a weird one for them. They, they played well. They, they from Noan Dora and Boomer, the two managers, they generally very thoughts is to try and play attacking football as much as they can. Now, they're probably lucky in the respect that it's, and no disrespect to others, it's junior football. A lot of teams are kind of know that the, the, the way to go forward is to go out and play attack and football, try and put as much scores on the board. And you can see that across all the league games, like all the, just the, the scores in general. Teams are trying to score heavily and outscore other, uh, their opponents. Where we're looking for success and and with the junior team is how many we can feed through then into the senior team and, and push that on while all obviously keeping a good standard in the junior team. Um, now, yeah, coming up from their league, going into the championship knockout stages, I, each each step from here on in, it to me is bonus territory. Now that's because I'm outside of the team. If I was inside the team. I'd be jumping at the bit going, oh, geez, we're going to go all the way, we're going to win it. That's the way the inside of the team has to be. But just from the outside, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy, very proud of the boys for the way they've, they've got a lot of people into the club that have kind of fallen by the wayside over the last couple of years just because of the, the, the avenue from football hasn't been there. So don't get me wrong, to be looking at college land thinking, there's, there's potential like they, they were never going to be able to face four kill because of the way the, the group stage is mad or fizzled out but they're probably looking at bally hagen just on on past performances in the championship thinking they'll be a tough opponent to get so it'd probably go four kill bally hagen and then st michael's college land a toss of a coin but i went through the college land team it's it's, it's a it's a tough ask like if you're not ready there He's strong on and and that's he's got a good kick out. He can he can be composed whenever he needs to be. Then actually, Tom Murphy at six, good footballer, can sweep up things. Can be he's just he's smart. He's been around for a way. Kehar McGeary, very very physical box. Like we talk about box to box, like he can he can go. And James Keely in with him. Um, yeah, I'm even looking at their scores. Jason Kelly, one twelve. Uh, and then Keelan McQuaid, 4-13. Like, to be kicking 4-13 across, I don't know that they have three or four chances. Three games, three games. Like, come on. Like, you can't yeah. make the option for 4-13. I don't think I've done that in my career. Like, <laughs> three games, how, how, you, how you tie people down like that, it's it's tough. So, 
formal service with whenever that draw came out, I was like, well, happy days, our boys have a have a realistic chance here of, of going out and really competing. And they still think they have that chance of going out and competing. But it, it's it's like anything else. It, the more you know, the better you're going to be. And our boys have been playing 3B all year. They haven't had a chance to come up against College Land. Now, College Land hasn't had a chance to come up against our ones either. Like, those sort of goes hand in hand. But see, my girls in Portmore have played each other. College Land, um, or sorry, Fort Kelly and Summon have played each other. Ballyhag and Milltown have all played each other. They all kind of know what each other's about. Our guys are coming on under the radar, which is brilliant. That underdog tactic, it, it, it does work. College Land will kind of be thinking they're being the back, on the back foot going, Jesus, if we get turned over here by a 3B team, what's, what's the story like? So there's danger. There's danger from both sides. There's danger of the unknown, but there's danger in that College Land just try and go out and go hard at it from the get-go um, and try and put as much on the board. But We'll, we'll see how it goes. Like it's not that our boys don't have the potential. Like there's Dan, um, Dan McNally. He's like forty nine thousand years old. <laughs> <laughs> he's run the bike. He's kicked one thirteen. You've made see he's kicked one twelve. And a lot of our boys are just. Some of them are, are well over thirty, <laughs> over and over forty. But then you have a lot of ones that are younger that are in around the bracket of 22 to about 26, 27. And they're the ones that we want them to learn the most because realistically they're going to be driving the club on in the next handful of years. Not that we're killing Danny off or Meetsy off or whatever. Like we still want them as to fulfill their potential. But we're trying to make sure that the younger ones have football to play against um, a game against the college land. I think that's that can only drive them on because it is it's going to be a physical game for them. Yeah, it's it's definitely one I, I would be looking forward to. Um, just I suppose the surprise element of St Peter's on the, the sort of unknown. Um, as you said, all the other teams playing each other, know each other, have played each other. Um, but I suppose that when we're talking about junior football, just before we wrap up, Arn, um, obviously Fark Hill are the favourites for the junior championship, and a big reason is because of Stephen Sheridan and Jamar Hall, who have been have been flying. I think Jamar has scored three. 13 maybe or something like that in the championship so far and, and Sheridan maybe he's got three goals as well three four three five so when you have two boys at that level playing junior football it's it's the obvious reason to know why why Fork Hill are the favourites for the championship to me they'd be out and out favourites for the championship um, the only thing that I reckon could could hurt them is Taking one eye off the prize. So if you have a couple of boys in the camp there that are maybe thinking, oh geez, if we win the championship, we could maybe go on ahead and, and give Ulster a rattle. And then geez, if you win Ulster, you're only really two matches away from an all iron and stuff. You don't want that feeding into into people. You just you, you do the here and now. Um, you even have the likes of Conor McGill from McGill. He gave our boys a headache, like an absolute headache the first day out. And uh, we were kind of chatting about it before. Stephen and Jamar, obviously everybody kind of knows about them at junior level. They're definitely going to be known throughout the county. Do teams have the players to match up one-on-one -on -one to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them? It's difficult. You, you probably, a lot of teams will really think can we go to that zone defence and, and try and slow them up. But as an outfit across the board, Farkill very much impressed me. Like even they played our boys in the first match and our guys are competing well with them going, going forward. We did, as I said, we did try to play on the front foot, but even whenever four kill got ahead, they still stuck to their sort of defensive structure. They did; uh, they always had one sitting back. They made sure that there was a sweeper there that just shot up, shot up. They were hard to break down outside of like the wee purple patch that our that our guys had. And then you were saying earlier on, they hammered the hammer. Like once it was once it was go time, they were like beating down on goal, making sure they were clinical taking scores that people coming in from the left and the right with both feet that was just always always hard to hard to handle the, honestly the only thing that i can see stopping them from winning a junior championship is their own their own uh, their own ambition and the fact that they'll just keep take the eye off the prize it's happened with former teams but i i would like to think steven himself Bug, he's a big like even here the all the boys with Arma, like that's why they got him back into the backroom team. Like he's a big person for driving standards and driving the processes and the principles and the and how the team play. I can't see him letting the boys get too high above the station 
I'm thinking about I'm thinking beyond one game, but yeah, it's it's it's, it's tricky for them there. Even looking at Fork Hill and the sum in their past games. Fork Hill the first one was two nine to one ten and the second one was seven three to, to one seventeen, both hand scoring games, but neither of them had the two boys. So do the summon the someone don't know realistically how to how to cope with them and in, in their own match play they've seen them play and probably looked at them on the tv and over previous years and stuff but at the moment it's a it's a tough ask and especially with other players like Sakono taking up the slack if jamar is getting a wee bit getting getting a bit of pressure it's very easy to just take jamar for take someone out the pitch and let him one-on-one -on -one at junior level unfortunately teams aren't mad just for the nature of it a lot of teams are rural and stuff like that they're they're not blessed with having three or four go-to man markers on a team that you can just shut people down that's why that's why david clifford got so got so far whenever it, whenever it went but yeah they're definitely the favorites like peter's second favorites <laughs> we'll see maybe we'll get them in the semi-final oh we can't actually meet we'll, we'll have to wait yeah, in the final know. hour to see um, we have our homework done for whenever it comes through um, <laughs> that too, but no one to be fair in all seriousness you just our boys are glad to have a good competitive game to really test themselves to really see where they're at they're in championship football a, a lot of them haven't played championship football in the guts of five or six years like and I'm, that, I mean a lot of them so to, to have that after a year and have the right attitude They've, they've done they've done the club very proud from that respect like. yeah big time um, no good stuff Aaron thanks very much for, for coming on um, we'll be covering all those all those five games as usual we'll have um, our previews our, our podcast obviously interviews and we'll have match reports from all the games we'll also have the senior championship um, quarter final draw it'll take place in Silverbridge after Kilebe and Graham Moore game so and um, we'll know all the teams who's through to the last eight at that stage. Um, all right, great to hear from you. Thanks very much for coming on, and we look forward to another big weekend of championship action. No problem. Good luck. Enjoy your show. So McCarlin's through. He might go for it. Still going. Trying to barge his way through. Goes to the Arriving Ryan O'Neill from an almost impossible angle. And that's the rousing score I'm now we're looking for. This is Connor Turbot. Kicks this one in. Oh, that's absolutely superb.